It is so good to be able to study together tonight. It's hard to believe that we are right at the end of the month of April and that this coming Sunday is May 1st. Time is flying by, but it's uh, good that we can continue on in this way studying the book of Genesis. I'm looking forward to seeing all of you this coming Sunday as we continue our class on 2 Timothy at 9.30 on Sunday morning, and then as we meet for worship at 10.30. I hope to see you this coming Lord's Day. Um, good news this week. I'm thankful that uh, my Uncle Micah is in town safely. So hello, Micah. I have not yet seen him on this trip. I'll hopefully see them tomorrow morning. But we're glad that you're here, and uh, the rest of you need to be here on Sunday so you can uh, meet my uncle from Tennessee, and uh, looking forward to that. And in terms of other good news this, this week, I know we haven't shared uh, good news for a little bit, at least in our Wednesday night class. Um, but I got back to swimming. Some of you know, got back to swimming on uh, Monday morning, bright and early, so that was the first time after uh, having survived COVID and uh, seemed to go pretty well. And uh, then this morning, I got back to running for the first time <clears throat> in several months. And that was a good experience. Uh, only did, I think, 1.6 miles, just over 18 minutes. So I was looking back and it was uh, January 14th or 15th was the last time I went running. At that time, we had some ice. And that's when I transitioned over to swimming for a few months. So uh, back at it this morning, although about a minute slower than I was last time I ran that distance a few months ago. But uh, looking forward to getting back into it and uh, getting back outside here in Wisconsin as the weather levels out a little bit. So uh, that's some good news. And I should, uh, I don't know if I should apologize for the floating head again tonight. If you're joining us online, if you're able to see the video, the black t-shirt is back in the rotation on the black background. So um, the first time I saw that, total accident. <clears throat> and I, I couldn't stop laughing <laughs> as I was watching class uh, myself later that night. But anyway, glad you're with us tonight. And uh, this is kind of uh, how it's looking for now. As I came down to my study a little bit ago to start recording the class, I remember that I mentioned a few weeks ago that I was coming to you from the jungle and all the plants around me. And so I thought I'd take a quick picture. So I just step back from the little podium here that my laptop's on and you may be able to see the microphone kind of above it on a little uh, gooseneck that's hidden by the laptop. Uh, surrounded by plants down here, but usually I close the blinds behind the computer here. And I uh, have some lights, did some research on lighting and try to minimize the reflection on the glasses at least as best we can in the circumstances that we have. So we're dealing with what we have and I am surrounded by plants yet again. A lot of these are rescues from different places that we've kind of multiplied in, uh, through the years. But anyway, I thought I'd give you a little bit of a behind the scenes here before we get started in our class. Uh, tonight we are continuing in our brand new study of the book of Genesis. So this is a book of beginnings. That's what the word Genesis means. It goes back to the opening line of this book. So it's the beginning of everything and then the beginning of the Jewish nation, uh, the beginning of sin, a lot of beginnings in the book of Genesis. And we learned last week it was written by Moses, at least most of it was, along with Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So those first five books of the Old Testament are sometimes known as the Pentateuch or the Torah. In terms of an outline of this book, we have the beginning of humanity in general in the first 11 chapters. Then we're introduced in chapter 12 to a man by the name of Abraham. And then we move on and we study his descendants for the rest of the book. So Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, followed by the 12 sons of Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel. And then we end the last maybe one quarter to one third of the book with an emphasis on Joseph and the explanation as to how the children of Israel end up in the land of Egypt. So this is Genesis in a nutshell. We'll be in this book, uh, I'm assuming, for about a year. So there are 50 chapters. We're two chapters in, roughly one chapter a week. That kind of seems to be the way it, that it's going. Uh, if you haven't done it already, I would still encourage you to either read or listen to the book of Genesis all in one sitting. So not just a verse here and there, but just sit down, read through the book of Genesis all at once. And that certainly helps us to see the big picture. I know there's a, view, there's a huge value in doing a verse-by-verse -verse study like we're doing. Uh, but the danger is we just see these tiny little chunks of scripture and they're all spread out and we kind of lose the sense of timing and the chronology of the book. I know when I was growing up, I knew all the stories. I knew about the flood. I knew about Joseph. I knew about Abraham. Uh, I knew about the creation in the rest of the Old Testament. I mean, I knew about Daniel and David and King Saul, but I had no idea which one uh, came first, second, third, fourth. I had no concept of the chronology until I sat down and read through the entire Bible. So if you want to do this with the book of Genesis, I would highly recommend it. It should take about three and a half hours, uh, which is not a not a terrible length of time. <clears throat> 
And if you aren't a good reader, I would suggest try listening to it all at once. Um, usually most uh, Bible apps have an option for uh, listening to the scriptures. If not, you can find one online for free. And I did this on a trip to Tennessee back in February. It was a very good experience to just listen to the book of Genesis from cover to cover, all 50 chapters over about three and a half hours. If you were here with us last week, you may remember we looked at the beginning of the universe itself, created by God in six days. Uh, we talked about some reasons why these are literal 24-hour days. We also just briefly noted that there are no gaps in this timeline, as some have tried to suggest. And <clears throat> then we continued several verses into chapter 2. And we noted that God rested on the seventh day. So the chapter division is a little bit unfortunate there. It really breaks at uh, chapter 2, verse 3. And then verse 4 starts a, a new section here. So we threw in the first uh, three verses of chapter 2 along with Genesis chapter 1. And we also noted that unlike a day, a month, or a year, the concept of a week, it has no scientific explanation whatsoever. Uh, science doesn't tell us how we got the week. There is no reasoning behind that. Instead, the fact that nearly every culture on earth today organizes time into weeks, uh, that is a pretty good testimony that God created everything in six days and that he rested on the seventh. That is where that division of time comes from. Well, tonight let's look at the rest of Genesis chapter 2, starting with Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 through 9. And I'll try to have this on the screen. If you have it in your lap on a Bible or a hard copy or on a device of some kind, that'd be even better. Um, then you can scroll back and forth and look up any references. But uh, we'll be looking tonight first at Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 through 9. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and heaven. Now no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted. <clears throat> For the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. But a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. <clears throat> Excuse me, my understanding of the rest of Genesis 2 is that Moses uh, focuses in, really, on the events of day number 6. <clears throat> and so Genesis 1 and the first three verses of Genesis 2, those are in chronological order. That's outlining the first week. And the rest of chapter 2, as I understand it, really gives us more information on the creation of man and woman on day number 6. So verse 4 then is a summary. Uh, it is something of a transition between these two accounts. And I hope we noticed a shift in the way Moses refers to God in Genesis uh, chapter 2 verse 4 here. In Genesis 1, Moses uses the word we would normally translate as God, and it goes back to the Hebrew word Elohim. That emphasizes God's strength or God's power. Uh, sometimes, by the way, Elohim was shortened, and it was used in other names referring to God. El Shaddai, for example, that's a name that uh, many of us have heard and are familiar with. Um, so that's in Genesis 49, 24, for example. So El Shaddai. Uh, it was also used in a number of names given to people. Um, Elijah, for example, meaning El is Yahweh. Or Samuel, meaning heard by El, and so on. So we have Elohim shortened to El, but Elohim is the word or the uh, name referring to God in chapter 1. That's the emphasis here. Um, by the way, we might have noted this last week, but the word Elohim is grammatically plural, although it is modified by singular verbs. And so we're not polytheistic. There is only one God. Um, but Elohim seems to hint, at least, that there are multiple personalities within the Godhead. And I know, as we discussed last week, that may not be the best way of putting it. Um, that's the best way I can find to explain it here. So it is something that we need to keep in mind. Um, let us make man in our image. We saw that last week in Genesis 1.26. Uh, starting in Genesis 2.4, though, in tonight's passage, God is now referred to as the Lord God for the very first time. And the word translated as Lord in this passage is God's personal or his covenant name. We transliterate this name as YHWH. Um, I believe it's known as the Tetragrammaton. So it's a, it's a word with four consonants and no vowels. 
I mean, Y-H-W-H, how in the world do you pronounce that? We really can't. We really don't have enough information there. And um, out of respect, so that they wouldn't accidentally take God's name in vain, my understanding is the ancient Jewish people would often substitute uh, the word God or Lord for this word. And even today, most modern translations substitute the word L-O-R-D in all caps instead of the word Y-H-W-H. And we see this in the passage on the screen up here. Notice Lord in all caps. Moses is not shouting the word Lord. <laughs> this is not the uh, all caps, the way we think of all caps many times today. But the translators have simply done this to show that uh, God's personal name is being used here. So why the shift from Elohim in chapter 1 to God's personal name in Genesis chapter 2. Why the difference? Why does it shift between verses 3 and 4? Well, the leading theory is that Genesis 1 focuses on God's power, his creative power, his ability to do some amazing things, while Genesis 2 focuses on God's relationship to his creation. And that makes sense to me. And that's something that I would understand. I think I would tend to agree with that. Uh, in chapter 1, God is this all-powerful creator, but in chapter 2, he is not only an all-powerful creator, but he is also a God who has a name. He is interacting very personally with his creation at this point. So he's not just God, but he is the Lord God. So his name is used in chapter 2. In verse 5, Moses reminds us the uh, ground had not been cultivated yet, so it has not yet rained. There, there are not crops growing in that sense of the word. In verse 6, we find there used to be a mist that would rise from the earth to water everything. Uh, some translations may refer to uh, a flooding of some kind, like local flooding, where the water would kind of come up out of the earth and overflow the banks, that kind of thing. Uh, we do know, as best we can figure, the environment was very different back then as opposed to how it is now. Um, I would compare it to uh, some kind of tropical rainforest, so very humid, everything is dripping, there's just this mist that is constantly surrounding everything. And I think of the rainforest out in the Pacific Northwest, uh, where my sister lives, where they have moss on absolutely everything. There is green on top of green. I've never seen so much green in one place. And so uh, we have trees growing out of the moss on other trees and then trees growing out of those trees. And if, if you slow down, uh, moss may even start growing on you. You got to be very careful not to get overtaken by it out there. I've seen moss on sidewalks out there. That's almost a tripping hazard. Moss two to three inches thick in spots on sidewalks and roofs. And you go to the hardware stores out there and everybody carries this uh, like anti-moss stuff that you put on your roof so that your house does not get overgrown by moss. So everything is green. And at least that's the picture in my mind now. When I think of what Moses describes in verse number six, there was this mist that used to come in and water everything. Even before there was ever rain, uh, nothing ever failed to uh, get nourishment and water. And in this environment, notice in verse 7, God creates man from the dust of the earth, and he breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. And I picture the breathing part of CPR uh, whenever I read this little passage here. God creates the body out of dirt or dust, and then he gives life to the body. He animates the body by breathing into it. I would also note here this is different from the animals. We have more specifics here. And uh, God seems to uh, take a different approach in creating human beings. In verse 8, we find God places this new human life in a garden, uh, the Garden of Eden. Um, this is not the Rocky Rococo flavor special pizza, the Garden of Eden, E-A-T-I-N, Garden of Eden, E-D-E-N. And in this garden, God gives Adam everything he would need. And uh, I don't think the word Adam is used here. I was trying my best not to use his name tonight because I think it just refers to him as the man or whatever. Uh, but uh, this man in the garden, this new creation, is given everything that he would need. So God very specifically designed this place as an ideal environment for this man to live. So all kinds of trees, including the tree of life, as well as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, we'll get back to this second tree next week in chapter 3. Um, but we should note that the tree of life is referred to here, as well as in Revelation. And I think a time or two, maybe in the book of Proverbs, maybe somewhere else, but uh, it kind of pops up here at the beginning. It's at the end of the Bible and just a time or two in the middle. 
Uh, but as I understand it, this tree gives life. Anybody who eats from this tree will not die as long as they eat from it on a regular basis. And as we'll find next week in chapter 3, access to the tree of life is restricted after the first sin, but access is restored in paradise in the life to come. And uh, this is the first reference, though, to the tree of life. It is uh, located here in Genesis chapter 2. So let's continue tonight with Genesis 2, verses 10 through 14. Genesis 2, verses 10 through 14. Now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. It flows around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good, and the delium and the onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It flows around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris. It flows east of Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. I think most of us are at least a little bit familiar with the Tigris and the Euphrates. Um, Pishon and Gihon are very much unknown. Uh, plus, I think it'd be safe to say the world changed dramatically after the worldwide flood coming up in chapters 6 through 9. Um, and so we, you know, we can't really nail down the location. And I, one of the commentaries I was reading uh, earlier today was that the point of the rivers here is not so that we can locate the Garden of Eden. We'll see why in the next chapter. Uh, but the point here is to show that it was a very special place. And uh, these are the rivers that flowed out from the Garden of Eden. And uh, somewhere in the Middle East, I mean, beyond that, you know, it'd be hard to speculate. But of course, we'll learn why in next week's class. Uh, let's continue tonight by con uh, continuing on to verses 15 through 17. So Genesis 2 verses 15 through 17. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. Notice in verse 15, God puts the man into the Garden of Eden, gives him a purpose. So his mission then is to cultivate and to keep the garden. And I know some people may imagine paradise as a place where we lay around on clouds all day, right? That's sometimes the concept of heaven. We're going to float on clouds, we'll have little halos, we'll get wings, and we'll just kind of float, little blobs kind of uh, floating through the universe or, or whatever, um, and doing nothing. That will just be a, a place of constant rest and relaxation. But here, notice... In an actual paradise, in the perfect environment, God gives this man, the first man, something to do. And so he is not, um, not lazy, that wouldn't be the best way of putting it. I mean, he's not lazy, absolutely. God gives him this mission to accomplish. Uh, but he's not just laying around doing nothing. He's given a mission to accomplish. And that also seems to be the case. Uh, not only in the Garden of Eden kind of paradise, but also in the life to come, in Revelation. In Revelation 22, 1 through 5, this is what John says. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of the light of a lamp nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. Boy, there's a lot in that little passage in Revelation 22. I think we see a lot of parallels between paradise in the life to come and the paradise in the first life here in the Garden of Eden. Um, but I hope we notice that in heaven... We, as God's bondservants, we will serve him. And so in the life to come, we will have work to do. We will have missions to accomplish. There will be things for us to do. So work itself, then, is not a curse. Um, work is a blessing to us. We need something to do. We need uh, these missions to do. There is a sense of purpose here. Of course, think about the bad part of work. That's getting tired and uh, bugs outside and... Uh, weeds in the garden, you know, that kind of thing. But of course, that won't be in the paradise to come. So I just wanted to point that out before we move on from this. And I know we'll get back to that a little bit next week. Anyway, in verses 16 and 17, God gives the man permission 
to eat freely from any tree in this garden, um, but he's not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if he does, the consequence is death. He will be immediately deserving of death, one commentary was saying. And again, we'll get back to that next week, but for now, the man has basically one restriction. There's one rule given here, and that is do not eat from this one particular tree. Uh, we seem to have something of a test, maybe. You know, why did God put it here if it was so bad for man to eat? Well, I think it was, in my view, a, a test of some kind. This was a test of the man's obedience. So the man is given complete freedom of choice. He is not inclined to do good. He's not inclined to do evil. Uh, he's a blank slate. Here you are. I'm dropping you in this perfect situation. Uh, but don't do this one thing over here. So he's not a robot but he certainly has the ability to choose whether he listens to God's instructions here. And I also want us to note, before we get to our class next week, <clears throat> to whom God gave the command not to eat. As I understand it, I mean, woman hasn't been created yet. So that original command not to eat of the tree was given not to Adam and Eve, uh, but that command was given to Adam uh, in, in particular. So again, we'll, we'll get back into that next week. So let's continue and then conclude tonight with the last paragraph. This is Genesis 2, verses 18 through 25. Genesis 2, verses 18 through 25. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed." I find it interesting that God starts in verse 18 with a plan, but he reveals this plan to the man very strategically. And I would also note that after declaring everything good in the first week of creation, after declaring the whole creation very good in Genesis 1.31, he now declares that the man being alone is not good. So this is the first not good thing that God observes in the creation. So my question is, why then didn't God make man and woman simultaneously? Why allow for the possibility of a not good situation? Um, you know, why did he not make them together as he seems to have done with the animals? And to me, the answer seems to come in verses 19 and 20. If you remember, this is on day number six. This is greater detail on what happens on day six. And on this day, on the day that he made man and the animals, God orchestrates, I would say, something of an animal parade. Isn't that pretty much what we see going on here, an animal parade, bringing these animals to the man to see what he would call them? How interesting that must have been uh, to see the giraffe, you know, whoa, look at that, and, you know, the elephant, and, and all of these creatures and all of their glory, and whatever... <laughs> popped out of Adam's mouth describing these creatures. That was the uh, the animal's name. And uh, so very methodical by bringing the animals before uh, Adam in quick succession. And obviously to name something normally implies some kind of ownership or control over something. You know, if we, uh, you know, build something, we have a right to name it. And that's pretty much what goes on here. But God delegates this power of naming the animals to Adam. And so the man then seems to be a manager or a steward of the creation. And we've seen this already in this chapter, and we see it again here in this situation. However, in this parade of animals, the man realizes that he doesn't have a counterpart, as the animals seem to have. You know, with the animals, I'm sure very quickly the man realizes that they come in pairs, male-female, 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 and so on. But he starts to realize, as this animal parade continues, that he doesn't see a match for him. 
So he, he's starting to think the wheels are turning. Something is missing here. Something is not right. And again, we aren't given too many details here as to the exact reason for this. Uh, but it seems to me at least that sometimes we, especially as men, often we need to see a problem to really appreciate it. So yes, God certainly could have made man and woman simultaneously. He had the power to do that. But in my opinion, God wanted the man to see and to truly understand the problem here, allowing him to ultimately appreciate what God does here in a solution in a way that he might not have appreciated otherwise. And I hope that makes sense, that God allowed this man to feel a sense of loneliness so that the man would appreciate what God does in creating the woman. In verse 21 then, God causes the man to fall into a deep sleep and he takes one of his ribs and uses that rib to create a woman. And I mean, that right there is so strange to us. Instead of creating the woman from the dirt as he did with the man, uh, God creates the woman from the man. And we aren't given the reason for this. Uh, we could speculate, um, but we don't have a reason given in Scripture for this. But we do have the man's response in verse 23. And it's set apart in the text, at least in the New American Standard that I'm using tonight, almost like poetry, like a song. Uh, the man is definitely pretty happy about this, isn't he, when, uh, when he wakes up. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Uh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Just an amazing thing that God has done here for me. And in other words, the man knows what has happened here. He wakes up maybe with a scar or uh, this wound in his side, and he realizes what God's done, um, that God has given him a helper suitable for him. So a companion, uh, not a slave, not a servant, uh, not another animal, uh, but she is man's counterpart. They are the perfect pair. They are made for each other. Uh, God has solved the not good to be alone problem. And he has solved it in a spectacular way, hasn't he? In a way that causes the man to truly appreciate exactly what God has done here. Now, many years later, of course, as Moses writes this account, he gives us the practical application of this event down at the bottom. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So this is the answer to the so what question. Um, hundreds, thousands of years later. Uh, this is what this chapter really means for us as Moses applies all of this to marriage. This is what this really means for us, practically speaking. Notice, for this reason. So since God created man and woman in this way, now at the time Moses is writing, and for all time, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. So let's note that the man and woman in Genesis 2, um, they didn't have a mother and father to leave, did they? No, they were created by God. I guess the question is, did they have belly buttons? That's a big discussion on this uh, chapter. Boy, you can probably argue that for hours in both directions. Um, but anyway, the point is, in this situation, Adam and Eve did not have to leave their mother and father, but Moses applies it in this way. So he's describing a new family unit, a man and a woman, and they are joined together by God in marriage. And um, I know sometimes when people describe a, a husband and wife who have a, have a child, they'll say, oh, now you've decided to start a family. And I, I, always, I always, I try not to do that myself. And, I, and the reason is a husband and a wife are a family regardless of whether they have children. And I, I hope that makes sense there. The family unit is the husband and wife. Children are awesome. Children are a great bonus. They're a gift from the Lord and all that. But just a husband and a wife together, they are a full-fledged family unit in the eyes of God. And so we need to, I believe, honor of them in that way. So, you know, may not be a huge deal here, but as I understand scripture, they are a family when they're first married. So if you're married and do not have kids, you're a family, uh, just as much as any other family. We have father, we have mother, we leave father and mother, we come together, we're joined to each other. And again, children can be a great blessing, but a husband and wife are a family unit as soon as they leave their parents and as soon as they're joined to one another. So I think that's one uh, practical application we can get out of this. Uh, another note from a practical point of view, the first man and woman never had this problem, but a man and woman must truly 
leave their parents. Okay, let's not forget that in this passage. Most of us, I think, have seen some uh, terrible consequences when parents or in-laws either interfere in their children's marriage or when the husband or wife runs back to mom or dad for comfort or validation of some kind. You know, that they get in a fight with their spouse and then they go and they uh, complain <clears throat> to mom or dad, you'll never believe what he or she did. Oh, poor you kind of thing. And that is not a good situation. Uh, when we marry, we are a new family unit. We now belong to each other. That bond um, as child to a parent, in a sense, is broken. We leave our parents at the point of marriage. Obviously, we still respect our parents. Uh, we can still care for our parents. We still love our parents. Um, but my spouse absolutely has to come first. We leave and we cleave, as some translations have put this. So we leave our father and mother and we become joined to each other. Uh, unfortunately, interference from in-laws continues to be a leading cause of divorce. Uh, you know, I think of that show, every, uh, what is it, Everyone, Everybody Loves Raymond? And I, I've never, I haven't seen all the episodes. I've seen a few episodes here and there through the years. But I remember one of those early episodes where Raymond was trying to figure out where to live. And as I remember it, he took out a map and he made two concentric circles from his house. And I don't remember the exact figures, but as I remember it, he wanted to be at least like an hour away from his in-laws so that they would have to call before they stopped in. But he didn't want to be any farther than like three hours from his in-laws so that when they visited, it did not require an overnight visit. <laughs> and so there was this, this little donut of an area where his in-laws could live. And that was just kind of funny, him planning this out and everything. Of course, if I remember correctly, didn't they end up right across the street from each other or that or next door? Uh, but way too close, and of course the in-laws caused all kinds of uh, trouble uh, in that family situation. But anyway, I kind of think of this whenever we read this verse here. Um, and anyway, kind of all kinds of trouble can happen with uh, in-law interference. But the point is, when we get married, uh, we have to make a conscious effort to leave our parents, both physically and emotionally, and to go and then be joined to our, our spouse. So it is the two of us against the world. And uh, we are for each other. We are the one that the other can rely on. At the very end, Moses also mentions that the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Um, unfortunately, that'll change in chapter 3, won't it? But for now, at least, they are together in this perfect environment. Everything about their relationship is, uh, is also perfect. I think uh, some have pointed out that... Uh, that they couldn't compare their spouse to their parents. That's another benefit that they had. Uh, you know, you didn't, you don't, you don't do it like my mom did, or whatever with cooking or house repairs or, or anything like that. So they did have some advantages, I suppose. Uh, before we wrap it up tonight, I want to note two more very practical applications that are actually made in Scripture. Uh, first of all, Jesus refers back to the beginning to emphasize the permanence of marriage. You may remember in Matthew 19, the Pharisees, they are testing Jesus. They're trying to uh, trap him or trick him up into saying something unpopular. And they were asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And you may remember uh, Jesus answered and said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore uh, God has joined together, let no man separate. And Jesus then refers back to Genesis 2 to show that marriage was originally intended to be a lifelong relationship. And I would also note that Jesus refers to Genesis 2, there in Matthew 19, as the beginning. So Adam and Eve didn't happen uh, billions of years after the beginning, as with the evolutionary system or theory, but Jesus describes Genesis 2 as taking place at the beginning, specifically six days in, right? I mean, we are on day number six of the creation at this point, and Jesus would agree with that. He refers to this going back to the beginning. Now, the second practical application here is tied to the special role of women in the Lord's church. Paul explains in 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12 uh, what those restrictions are, and then he gives the first of two reasons for those restrictions in verse number 13. 
For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. And notice how he says, he gives the restrictions, and then he says, for it was. <clears throat> in other words, this is the reason for the rule that I just gave. So the role of women in the church then is tied, first of all, to the order of creation. Not the sin, that comes right after that. But the first reason for the role of women in the church and those restrictions that Paul gives, it's tied to the order of creation. And I know many times today, many will say, well, Paul's words are out of date because we live in a different time. We live in a different culture. I've heard people say, if Paul would have written Madison, he would have given far different directions than he gave when he wrote to Timothy in Ephesus. However, I just want us to notice that the reason in 1 Timothy 2 is not tied to culture. He didn't say you need to do this or behave in this way because of things in Ephesus. But he tied those restrictions to the order of creation. He tied it all the way back to the beginning. So that is definitely a pre-cultural, we might say. Uh, there was no culture in the Garden of Eden. We just need to note here that this event in Genesis 2, it is still relevant to us today. Number one, because it's cited by Jesus as being relevant as to the permanence of marriage. And then secondly, because it's cited by Paul as a reason for the special role of women in the Lord's church. So there's a, uh, some good reasons for studying this chapter tonight. Well, this brings us to the end of our study tonight. Let's, next week, let's uh, plan on looking at Genesis chapter 3, which is a huge chapter in the Bible, one of the most important passages we could ever look at. Uh, thank you again for taking time to study Genesis with us tonight. I hope to see you on Sunday at 9.30 for our study of 2 Timothy, and then hope to see you at 10.30 for worship as well. Now let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the one and only great and awesome God, the creator of heaven and earth. You made us, and tonight we confess that as our creator, you have every right to rule over us. You also love us, even to the point of sending your own son as a sacrifice for sin. Thank you, Father, for providing for us. We're thankful for life itself, and we're certainly thankful for this amazing, beautiful world that you have prepared for us. Bless us this week as we share our love for you with this world. Give us the courage and wisdom to love our families just as you have loved us. We come to you in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.